welcome all to Talisman Meditations. This is the fortnightly community call uh, where we are lucky enough to have guests from around the ecosystem come on uh, to chat about their project and have a bit of an informal discussion about what they're doing in the Paraverse. Um, for those that don't know the format, I'll give a really quick update on all things Talisman and development uh, in, in about 30 seconds. I'll try and try and cap it to that uh, before we get into our AMA. And this week, we're lucky enough to have at least one attendee from uh, a really exciting parachain called Ajuna Network. Uh, so welcome, Nick, and potentially uh, Cedric, if uh, if Cedric is in here as well. Hey, great, great for thank you for having us here. Obviously, it's been quite a, a fun week for us being able to launch our first season of awesome Ajuna avatars. And and we were so happy to have so many, um, you know, uh, users from Talisman come over and, and check out the experience. At the end of the day, uh, season one, I would say, was dedicated towards the ecosystem or sort of at least tailored, let's say, towards the ecosystem. Um, so, yeah, having everybody in here, having the Spirit Clan come uh, join in, in the fun was uh, really awesome. Hope you all enjoyed it. And we're taking your feedback and see how we can prepare for season two. Although it ended a bit a bit uh, sooner than we would like, this falls under the under the category of you know good problems to have people enjoyed it, have fun. So uh, yeah, happy to be here. Absolutely. I think Cedric Nick. also uh, just joined, so maybe he can also just say a, a hello, and we can go on. Perfect. Well, the first question is a bit of a hello. It's. Who is who is Nick and who is Cedric, uh, and how did you get involved in the Juno network? Good. Cedric, I think you should go first. Yeah. So how how I got involved in the Juno network? I think that's a long story, and uh, the story started somewhere 2015, right? So I was already mining in Bitcoin earlier like 2013 and uh, 2015 I was super interested in trying to create an application and I was like trying to use the Satoshi part of the transaction to encode logic onto the Bitcoin ledger and then just to read it out and later on 2017 I had like this idea to use just this mechanism to build a game on top of Dash and yeah, I mean, obviously, Dash uh, proof of work was quite slow. And a little bit later, I was aware of Substrate. And at that point, I thought like, hey, that's a really nice technology. And it will give me like 6 to 12 second blocks. And I will have an own sovereign blockchain to just like provide whatever is needed for games, right? And at that point, I just went into and tried to create a API to be able to use Unity uh, and Substrate together. And I think there the journey begins. Uh, so I was like looking for the Web3 grants and started like with a small grant. And at that point, I got like into it and started uh, more or less the base of Iuna network. So that's a little bit about me or how I got into Iuna Network. I'll take the sort of I'll take the the second story. So um I, I first got I would say involved in the blockchain space uh, actively uh, about five and a half now, six years ago. Uh, I had already sort of gone through uh, entrepreneurial journey in what we would call now a traditional web two startup where I was trying to fix a um, make a, a fitness um, and Netflix, let's say, for fitness. So always trying to uh, gamify products was was uh, found. I found it very interesting. And yeah, as I said, about six years ago, uh, with a few other people, I got sort of introduced a bit to the space beyond Bitcoin, right? Sort of beyond the cryptocurrency side of it, uh, and, and started exploring sort of the potential. And back then, we started trying to build our own, let's say, layer one. Uh, for gaming, which was an awesome experience, a painful experience, right? Because I think one of the first things that uh, as a lesson sort of getting out of it, I discovered is that it's very difficult to build outside of an ecosystem, right? Um, so because we were not building on Ethereum or for uh, some other chain, it was very difficult for us um, to get any sort of community or, or traction going. Uh, but sort of my, the, the what clicked to me eventually uh, came back to 
digital uh, ownership. Uh, sort of somebody who grew up fascinated by games and fascinated by technology, where all of these items meant something to me, right? Sort of, uh, uh, I vividly remember sort of my experience playing Halo at university and, and, and you know, trying to find, you know, memorabilia and sort of shirts because these characters meant sort of something to me. And um, yeah, I think um, the change over the past few years where we saw this proliferation of of pay as you go services, you know, like Xbox Live, where you end up owning nothing, um, just doesn't doesn't seem the way forward. Um, so yeah, it was uh, then a couple of years ago, uh, a bit less actually, where uh, we we hooked up with uh, C- uh, Cedric and sort of our um, visions towards how we see Web three, how you know how we see a future of gaming matched very well. Uh, and I joined Ayuna uh, on this journey, and I joined Cedric and Andre, uh, who invited me to be part of, of of this journey. So, yep, that's a bit my path to Ayuna. Awesome. Uh, and you mentioned the, the the kind of the shared vision that you have um, together for how you see gaming, and I can see that quite a few people in the school have an Ayuna avatar already. But for those that don't. Uh, and uh, kind of more unfamiliar with your network. Um, what is this vision and what are you trying to build? Yeah, so, I mean, <clears throat> I, I think when we started, we, we had like our game. Uh, so, I mean, before we, we started on creating infrastructure, we wanted to elaborate how we can use the blockchain as an infrastructure and how we can like play on it and make it like fully decentralized. So having really the logic on chain, so nobody would care for a server infrastructure because it would just be available for everyone there. And over the time, uh, I mean, obviously we have been going into like uh, trying out technologies like trusted execution environment to exactly provide this like game logic on chain but like not with the the like bad parts of a blockchain like slow latency and um, full transparency and uh, we tried out a lot of things uh, we created with integrity a proof uh, of concept or let's say a prototype where you could play or where currently you can play with your mobile device dot for gravity with 300 milliseconds day transition but so the goal to have like everything on chain is something which is one of our visions, like using the technology to pro- provide a full, full uh, decentralized experience without cannibalizing the the game itself or the user experience. I mean that is like the big vision. Now the technology is currently still far away to provide like an infrastructure that is able to provide this at the moment to be competitive with Web two. But what we have seen over the past two and three years is that digital ownership means much more and can be way more attractive for traditional gamers than than currently they they are. Because in some way, like games have been always like a one one directional um, partnership. So you as a player, you bought something, you played and then it's over. And what Web3 can provide is way more. It's like it can create an engagement from your side as a player, as an investor, but also as somebody that has like a governance or a vote or a say in it. And I think that's really important uh, when we look into the future. Because when we look at the past five years in gaming, then we all have been playing like... Uh, super many sequels of FIFA, FIFA 1, 2. Every year we have a FIFA. Every every year we have a Call of Duty. It's always the same, but we always buy it. We play it a little bit. And only a, a small amount of games are really able to attract us over some time. So, like, people are only playing, like, really a small amount of time. They're, or They are buying a lot of games, and only a small of them... Uh, are really able to attract their um, their long term um, uh, attention, right? And we believe with digital ownership, we can we can create a much higher loyalty and a much higher binding by not only seeing a, a customer as a player, 
but also seeing him as a part like a content creator, but also like somebody that has a say in the game. And I think that all starts with digital ownership. And the avatars is is like our our try on starting this journey into how can we connect us with something which is like a digital good which we care for and which we take into that journey and which will be part of the upcoming years and give us like access to different things and so that's why we started with the awesome univatars like to provide something which creates engagement in us and where we can go into that journey on 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 following a game so like this season one and season two obviously two uh, are part of our battle mox flagship game which in fact will give you access to them or to every perks uh, that will exist there so access to the beta season access if there is an nft exhale so if you're a legendary owner then it's you the first one that can hands on if there is an airdrop then it's the legendary owners that get the hands on and so on like really starting on connecting people to a game that will come really early and those seasons are really like to create like this loyalty between web3 and future web2 companies that bring their product into the blockchain space so that that's a little bit about the vision uh, behind the Ion network but uh, yeah i mean nicholas can probably add some Demetrius. content too yeah, yeah uh, just a short um maybe point from um from my side uh, that that comes more again sort of that we are trying to see what we saw the everybody saw how the nft market uh, went sort of into this multi-billion dollar industry over the past couple of years but when you see it from the perspective of of a gamer it seems that the experience is completely in reverse right uh, where as we were mentioning before the reason why these items at least in gaming right have value starts with the premise that i care about them right that i've spent enough hours in order to go through the experience, the game with them, which means that they have created an intrinsic value to them. So that's the point where we see where triggering a user to tell him that, look, you actually own this and there's options and things that you can do with this uh, is where it makes sense. It seems that the industry up to now has gone the other way around. We start with the NFT, it, let me go this, all you have to do is go and buy it. Um, and, and so it starts with the financial incentive. Right, which we think that sort of for gamers is 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 the wrong approach. We're trying to sort of get to the point that um, we we create experiences where these digital assets start connecting with the user, and then introducing sort of those Web three concepts uh, is sort of a goal that we have uh, in the long term. But yeah, that's from me. Cool. It it really sounds like uh, the the Ajuna avatars are almost like. Uh, a reference implementation or um, just uh, an example of kind of a, a pattern in game development that you would like to see um, become more apparent where it, where the focus is on digital ownership. It's on like kind of orienting the uh, a community around the game um, in a meaningful way. And and that's that's kind of the vision of the project rather than a very specific like style of gameplay or or, or something like that yeah exactly i think that's actually um a, a a really good point in terms of how we try to see we saw the osma yuna avatars as after sort of talking with different projects small studios bigger studios you see that the common struggle for most um game developers is that i need to find a community and i need to find money because uh, and especially for gaming uh, it's very resource heavy very expensive sort of to make a game uh, very low rates of success in terms of a return in your investment and very difficult to get the attention of the community right because you're fighting against massive sort of franchises and ips and companies so um it's very it's very, really really very difficult so we tried to answer with this product something directly which is how do we get to support teams which are early on in the development of their game right sort of they're about to release so there's quite a lot of work obviously that's been put already at that stage uh, but at they're at that point that they want sort of to get the support of a community and we see the awesome my avatars and the seasons that we've been putting as an opportunity for you to introduce um, in a quite simple and resource efficient way your 
your vision for your game. So in our case, battle mocks, you know, it, they were they were uh, inspired by the characters there. We use sort of forces, we use uh, um, um, the lore or the gameplay or sort of things that we have thought for our game. And it's a way that we can create this early audience with that early audience then we'll jump into that first um, beta that's here of your game. So that's the way that we saw sort of that experience so and and as we're going to be progressing the awesome ayuna avatars throughout the seasons and also beginning um working on on the legendary adventures that we're going to be taking them our idea is over the next year create small really polished experiences which allow for web3 to shine with its deficiencies right there's no point of trying to hide look um um the integration or sort of asking people to sign up with a wallet is something which is it's simply unfamiliar with them so there's no point of us trying to hide it or anything like that we just try to make sort of experiences where um it can all make sense and it's rewarding in the end awesome um well let's let's see this experience to date um i think the those kind of regulars amongst you in in the audience um have probably realized that the Discord call has taken a slightly different format this week, where instead of the kind of stage audience setup, um, we've got uh, kind of a more conventional call, and that's because it allows uh, the guests to do a bit of a demo, um, and we can see with our own eyeballs um, the exciting work that Arjuna have done this week with their launch of the avatars. So, Nick, it looks like you have something prepared. Uh, would you like to give us a run through of essentially what's happened in the past couple of weeks with, with respect to your launch and uh, what users and Spirit Clan members can, uh, can interact with at the moment? Hi, this is uh, Nicholas from Mayuna Network, and I'm here to give you a short demo uh, behind the scenes, let's say, look of the awesome Mayuna avatars. Osma Yuna Avatars or AAA is our first product, uh, our first game that is coming to market. It's an essentially an NFT collective game based on the heroes of Ayuna. It's going to be a different number of seasons and each season will be themed around a different game that's either going to be launching on Ayuna Network or a different product that's either going to be launching or used within the Ayuna network. This first season of the Osma Yuna avatars is based or inspired uh, by our own flagship game, Battlemox. So uh, it's around uh, our little mischievous uh, Mogwais, uh, which have a, a pretty rich lore, which I'm pretty sure we'll be able to get into in some point later on. Over the next 10 minutes, I want to give you most importantly, an overview of the experience itself of the Osma Yuna avatars. I'll also tell you a bit about the team behind it and you know our inspiration of how the awesome Ayuna avatars came to be. Uh, so without further ado, I'll go directly into the game itself. So the first thing that you're going to be introduced to is our beautiful dashboard. I will have to log in. Currently, I am logged in. In order to log in, you will have to access the game through a browser on your desktop, for example. Chrome, Firefox, Mozilla are the ones that work the best and are optimized. And you will need to connect your Polkadot wallet, at least for season one. For a Polkadot wallet, you have three, let's say, different choices that we could recommend that can be, you can obtain it from the Polkadot the Polkadot JS one, you can get a sub wallet or a talisman, all work perfectly fine. Currently, I'm here, I'm connected with, if I'm not mistaken, with my talisman wallet, I'm ready to go and here is my dashboard. In my dashboard, I'll be able to find information about, uh, let's say, my current status in the game, how many avatars do I have, how many soul points do I have in total, and I'll also be able to have an overview of the total number of players and activity within the game itself. We will also here share news and updates and different, let's say, competitions or incentives that we're going to be doing throughout the first season and also sharing success stories and news from our different users. So what's the first thing that I would do here? Let's go get ourselves some cards. Let's go mint ourselves our first pack. Uh, so the first thing that I can do here is select my free mints. I can either choose to pay with my Bayou tokens, but you know, if you have free mints, use your free mints. And generally look out everywhere around, let's say, Ayuna Network from our Discord to Twitter, there's going to be uh, opportunities to get your free mints. So in this case, I'm going to go select my, par uh, my uh, pack of six cards. Yes, I am lo logged in with my Talisman wallet. I will approve the transaction, happily so, and get my six. Oh. And as you see, my mint is successful. I have added six more avatars to my already 
pretty awesome collection. Then all I have to do is I can go in my inventory, which as you can see, is looking already pretty, pretty strong. And I can have a selection of my different avatars. Now, once you the game uh, starts for you as a new user, you will have 25 total slots in order uh, to be able to manage your inventory. As you keep forging and as you keep minting new and new avatars with the goal of getting to that legendary, uh, you will have to manage very carefully uh, that inventory. Uh, now, in my case, it got big, I couldn't manage it, so the best strategy for me was to just spend a few by you in order to increase my inventory by 25 slots. But you'll figure these things out on your own. Let's do the simplest and sort of most fun thing here. And first step, just look at your, your awesome Ayun avatars and select the one that you think looks the cooler. I mean, for me, this one looks really good, to be honest. Let's go with something a bit more colorful. Let's go with something that's pink for a change. Okay, this one looks pretty good. So, Obu Usi, huh? we're like... Let's call him Obi Wan for Good now. Job. I kind of like it. So as you can see, when you open the card, there's different information here, which is quite important. The more that you get into the forging and minting of the process of the game. So first of all, as you can see, each Osma Yuna avatar has its own name. It has its own force. There's six different forces throughout the universe, let's say, of the Osma Yuna avatars, which are very special and very sort of well connected to each and every Osma Yuna avatar. Do forge at the right time and that force will reward you. Do it at the right time and you will lose an opportunity. So as you can see, this one, Obi-Wan is thermal. He has 90 soul points. Soul points are essentially like your XP points. Every time that a Mogwai is sacrificed, his soul points are transferred to you. So there's no forge that goes, let's say lost, always the soul points are transferred. But that does not mean that the rarity or the strength increases. And then you have the rarity. So as you can see, there's three levels of rarity. There's a common, there's a rare, and there's a legendary. And our goal is to get to legendary. Each level comprises, each uh, rarity comprises of them different levels. And once you complete and reach the 10 levels, you will go on to the next. You can also at any time put your uh, Osma Yuna avatar, right? If you think you've done a good job, but you know, uh, maybe somebody else would like it. You can always put it on the market. So let's say I'm going to choose to put this one for 12 by you on the market. All I have to do is click, sign my transaction, and he's going to go into the internal market of the game. So anyone now that can join can go and buy my uh, Obi-Wan and it's his forever but let's go back to my uh, inventory and let's go ahead and do a forge so i'll take this one i kind of like this one so this is an astral one that i opened out of my pack uh, it's brand new it's already three common uh, so once you open a pack all of the cards will be at common uh, rarity and they can be from uh, zero or one up to a maximum of five bars uh, filled so i'm gonna start with him let's see okay what i have to do let's forge so then I have my inventory on my left. In my forge panel, uh, there's information that will uh, guide me towards the successfulness of my forge, which I can see here in the forge estimation. Now, immediately on the left on my collection, I can see quite a few of these avatars glowing to me. I'll go ahead and assume that a good sign and I'll select them and add them to the forge. And as you can see, I have to up to four slots that I can add. Every time that I'm adding a card, you can see that both my soul points, my probability of success for my forge in terms of rarity increases and I can see the probability of how many bars it can maximum increase. So now that I've added the fourth one, I see that suddenly I've jumped to excellent and I can get up to 40 points or fill four bars. So I'm going to go ahead and forge. So let's see what happens. It said that I can get an excellent up to four bars. I approve my transaction and forging magic things in the background and oh, this looks pretty cool. So here you can see the before and after and immediately you can see sort of the difference. Now this one is, is holding some sort of Let's see, I'm not going to say pet, but it's something there that he's holding, something something powerful uh, that he has already upgraded. So before, you know, he had 21 soul points. Now he's up to 217. And let's see how he did in the forge. So from uh, what I can see from the forge, uh, I was kind of hoping that I was going to get four, but I only got one. Although these things were glowing to me and sort of calling out to me to forge, something something didn't go well. So it's that strategy that you need to figure out and, and identify to find out what the perfect forge and how you can maximize those probabilities. So let me give you a few hints. The first one I gave it to you. When something glows, that's good. Now the second thing we talked a bit about, which is about the forces, right? Sort of the six different forces. There's astral, there's kinetic, there's thermal, there's dream, there's empathy. These six forces, as I said, all of them have their own unique forges, which have to happen at the correct time. Now another thing that you may have noticed here in our interface is this quite mysterious looking clock up here. 
and if you see it's actually moving it's our star clock and once you step upon it you'll find a bit of a map a bit of a hint of what's actually going on here let's say walk you through a bit of at least what we can see here on the, on the surface of things 12 different constellations as you can see all of them with their own unique insignia uh, all of them represented also on the clock itself which is turning as it turns a different constellation let's say is highlighted so yeah you can think of it a bit like like the horoscope when it's december you know that's when my birthday is uh, i'm a sagittarius that's my month you know good things happen in my month uh now as we said also before we have this tale which is from chapter one of the forces page 42 which explains a bit it has this riddle about the, the different constellations and how this may or may not connect with the different forces solves that connection between the forces and the timing of the forges and you're on your way to create a legendary this one amod who is currently my legendary and ranked number one in the leaderboard uh, actually took me quite a lot of time uh, in order to create quite a lot of forges a few mistakes uh, but a lot of fun along the way and that's the end goal here right to create sort of that perfect forge and create that legendary osma Unavat. so that's a bit about the experience of how it is to forge and mint the goal being as i said to top the leaderboards and have all of the bragging rights but it's not only about bragging rights but on the leaderboard uh, there's two views there's two things that you can sort of compete for it's uh, you know your the the status of your hero sort of who's the most powerful the most epic so here is where it's the race to the most powerful legendary and then it's a race to soul points as we said soul points are always transferred from uh the mogwais or the osma yuna avatars uh, that you are forging sacrificing to grow the other ones uh, so they never get lost here it's broken into three categories there's common rare and legendary and you can uh, top the leaderboard in any of these categories to have the one with the most soul points both soul points as well as uh, sort of status will unlock different experiences as we move further on after let's say season eight. thanks for the demo nick and if anyone has any questions feel free to chuck them in the event hangout chat or the event chat at discord um but right off the cuff uh the whole demo kind of reminded me of something you said right beforehand which was the aim is to create like small polished experiences that doesn't necessarily like push the web three to the corner and it, but instead lets it shine. Um, and th I think this does a really good job of that where the, I, I mean, I assume the solar clock is, is in some way kind of um, derived from block production. So, you know, using the network guarantees that everybody sees the same clock. And then, then that's like, you know, the core mechanic of the, of the forging. Yeah, that's a, uh... That's exactly sort of the point. We tried some things are, as you said, are more obvious. Obviously, sort of wallet integrations and things like that are more obvious or sort of forging and minting as transactions. But yeah, the clock is one of those things that we thought was a, uh, yeah, that was a, a brilliant idea by, by Cedric to, yeah, create that and put it there. And, you know, for most users, they won't know what exactly it relates to, but it's exactly what you mentioned. Awesome. And just just uh, to dig into that, um, what would be the alternative and why would you not be able to kind of make the same guarantee about, you know, the, like the legitimacy or the, or the fairness of the clock? Um, if this was just kind of a, a conventional web two kind of platform game. Oh, um, so I think it, it wasn't so much, um, um, whether we wanted to guarantee um, so sort of we went the other way around. So sort of we thought, okay, look, we have some limitations with the technology. This is a cool thing that we can do with it to make it something useful, right? You know, nobody likes to hear about 12 second blocks or six second blocks or sort of waiting for transactions. So we just tried to find a way that we can implement it from a gameplay point of view, where it was super useful, was when we were actually playing it. So when we're sort of all sitting on the Discord over the weekend, whether that's the team between us or... Um, with our users, we all knew, hey, look, we're in this constellation, which means that we need to forge um, um, a kinetic. It yeah. created uh, in a very sort of simple way, uh, a common thing right in the middle of the screen that we all are looking, trying to figure out what it means and asking each other, so what does this symbol now mean? And what does it matches? So uh, I think the thought was more around the gameplay. Yeah, exactly. So the thought was around the gameplay, but also because in Battle Mox, you are able to morph your Mogwai, and it has a similar um, 
uh, it's just like similar. It, there has like uh, there is a moon phase, and it's obviously driven by the block, and they can like morph in four states. And so, at the beginning, we hadn't the star clock in it, and Nicholas and me, we were like playing, and it was quite cool to do it, but it was it was somehow not really. Um, it, there was not nothing to master or to understand, so we thought like, how could we implement some additional things? And then we took just like like the forces. They are also from Battle Mox. Those six forces exist there, and you have like cards and skills. They are all relying to those forces. Like kinetic is more like a punching uh, force, and there is like the healing force, which is more like empathy and so on. So we took like just like those things from Battle Mox and just tried to to let's say to to make them very minimalistic. But still, like representing and having like an, uh, a game design aspect in it that will just like create the users to to take the time to understand and get him like into a yeah into a workflow or let's say play flow which is differently now. I mean, if you probably ask those that have been like forging all the time, they will tell you they just like go to a, go in in like in in sync with the clock so you wait till you have like kinetic then you start all you to forge all your kinetic till the point that you see like one block before then you wait till the next then you go through all so it's like it gets like into a once you got like the the game and and how it works then you get into a like a repetitive changing entertaining or let's say yeah a uh, small uh, game flow play flow yeah so uh, but the block time i mean obviously on a blockchain it's like one of the things that you always can use like the block hash which you can use for different things awesome and the the solar clock is kind of driven kind of by block production it seems but you, you also mentioned prior to the demo that uh, you're, levering, you're leveraging a trusted execution environment for some of the game logic that kind of might exist in this game or other games on Arjuna. Uh, is there an aspect of the Mint and Forge game that you demoed that is kind of run on the trusted execution environment as well? No, no. This, this, uh, this game resides fully in a pallet. Uh, it's like the... what what Substrate provides as the uh, modular environment to create your your um, runtime modules, uh, and that's it. There is no use case here to use um, a trusted execution environment. We use trusted execution environment when there is like the need of very um, fast state transitions, like 300 milliseconds, and also if there is a need of privacy. So, if, for example, if you play poker something like there is like um player informations which need to be hidden from its opponent which are probably 99 percent of the games uh, uh, the case like um, probably not in chess because everyone sees the same thing but most of the game currently in web 2 they they have like some hidden information and that's also one of the points where I think trusted execution environment come in very handy because they just like provide to each user what they can see and should see, but still maintain like this trusted execution that everyone knows, okay, I know exactly this game logic hasn't been touched and is like genuine uh, being executed there. And yeah, so we had like a demo at the Sub-Zero conference where we showcased um, Dot for Gravity on mobile, which was playing over a layer one, a substrate chain, and a layer two, which was a substrate trusted execution chain with 250 to 300 millisecond state transition, which allows you to play like three to four moves in a second at this max awesome that's like a kind of almost indistinguishable latency um and i also understand that the trusted execution environment also allows yourselves and other game developers on a 
to integrate with some kind of familiar and really kind of mature um, game development technology like Unreal and Unity. Exactly. I mean, that was like our entry point. Uh, it's what we have been building for the past two years. So like just having a substrate uh, C-sharp uh, API, which is just like representing all the access that you need from your uh, substrate chain and giving that access right into Unity and Unreal. So you can call, so for example, you could create now, um, or we already had, or, or we have a mobile version of uh, the awesome Ayun avatars, but we weren't like satisfied with the play experience because it was just, it takes a lot more time to make like such a game really usable and enjoyable on mobile than here on web. So. That allows like this Unity uh, SDK that we created for Substrate allows you to access all those information that you usually would access uh, like on the palette uh, just in Unity without any harm. So even the even there is no need for for a palette uh, for a palette uh, because the integration is inside Unity. So you don't even need a third party. Uh, application to enter your wallet. It's all integrated in Unity. Might be not awesome. so interesting for Talisman, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you, you say that, but um, one of our junior engineers last year, um, yeah. and, and also a little bit this year, uh, created a game in Unity and connected to Talisman and, and inside of the game. And okay. the Unity shell was was your address, and you you were able to uh, connect your wallet, see your address from the wallet inside of the game, and then that was your like identifier for for playing, which was which was kind of nice. Well, that's that's nice. cool. Um. So if I am an up and coming, budding game developer, and I'm familiar with these kinds of tools, um. What might draw me towards uh, deploying on on a Juno network? Is it the fact that it's all run in this trust execution environment, and that I can compose like different actions that use block kind of the block time to create an interesting mechanic? I, I think it's it's more uh, towards how I can leverage a community and how can I create for my future game something which is attractive from day one because like creating a real game like a, a web 2 game that is really interacting with digital assets uh, on on the blockchain takes like time so it's not like something which is finished in in like two or three months so it, it's something that will take like one or two years and at the end of those two years you might go out with the beta and the thing is, like, if you go out in Web two, obviously you you're gonna try to to compete with all those. Yeah, I mean, there is like a few big publishers, and they have like a really big noise. So, like, uh, get, getting through that noise will be very hard. So, what you are looking for is like a community, like like believers in your product. They follow you from day one, and they are really exciting and. What we offer for them is like they can create like a season. We help them to create the season, which is dedicated to their game, and they can create like uh, like this uh, tight uh, uh, connection with their avatars from their game, right? And the next thing is that we currently um, or we bought by end of last year, we bought the IP from a um, off-chain trusted execution market for the gaming and the entertainment vertical and this allows us like to maintain a web 2 experience with unity so it's like traditional you don't feel anything your digital assets are minted instantly there is no uh, state transition delay uh, and it's gasless obviously because it's uh, off chain but at some point when you like integrate it and you play in a progression of your game you might be starting to try to go on a market and at that point it will take you to onboard on a blockchain is it like 
by your network or a UNA network or is it Ethereum, you you just are able then to onboard. And that's what we are working towards at the moment, uh, like creating the Polkadot adapter uh, for substrate for Erdstahl, which is like this IP. And uh, that will allow you to onboard and offboard game assets into this trusted execution environment and move the assets onto other chain. And this use case, obviously, we are moving with uh, the trust, uh, the awesome Ayuna avatars, like moving them uh, over this operator to uh, Ethereum. So what we are currently proposing is like a way to start engaging with your communi community at an early stage, but also like offering you all the integration layers with Unity. So. Yeah, depending on what you use, if you use like uh, what you see uh, in the awesome Ayuna avatars, you still have like third party valid. If you use Unity and Unreal, you don't have, you you have the valid inside the game itself. But also if you already have like a game in Web2, you are able to connect it with the um, trusted execution operator off chain and already try to manage the assets in trusted execution environment from there it's like only a small step then afterwards to onboard them on any of those three chains that i mentioned before maybe if i can add just a, a bit of uh, uh, or a different let's say perspective on on um the question of okay what game developers can look forward to um i think Technology has never been a limitation for creativity in gaming. Probably I would say quite the opposite. Some of the most creative games that you will see will run on systems, whether that's called a Nintendo Game Boy. Uh, but maybe a, a better example is that it's not, you know, maybe 10, 20 years ago, 20 years ago when we started sort of first having mobile phones and we started putting screens on them, the first real game that became a global hit was Snake, right? And it was nothing. That was the maximum that you could do with that screen, right? Sort of fill it up with black dots, do circles, and 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 chase things forward. Then later came smartphones, and and sort of in the beginning, everybody looks at these new devices or new new technologies with all of these limitations. And you know, initially people try to port usually things. Hey, let me take Call of Duty and put it on mobile, for example. It doesn't work. But somebody who embraces usually the technology is the ones that are going to come up with those unique small experiences like Snake, like Candy Crush or whatever you want to call that sort of first type of games that really took advantage of both um, the new technology or device and also the opportunity to explore different models. So there's no free to play without mobile phones, right? Sort of if it wasn't for mobile phones, the, the industry would not have shifted. So if you're a game developer, uh, and sort of want to embrace sort of this web technology and want to create, uh, I think Ayuna is the perfect place to come create these um, unique contained experiences, which can be um, as when we play, so what are awesome Ayuna avatars, right? At the end of the day, it's that starting screen when you're starting that game, uh, like sort of the first time that you load up World of Warcraft, uh, where you have to create your character. And usually you're gonna spend a couple hours there to create the character perfect because you're gonna take him he is going to take you on a journey for the next sort of hours, days, or months or years for a lot of people. So that's what also my Unavatars is for developers. That sort of first touching point that you can create engagement with the community. Awesome. And uh, I, I really like the, the mobile example where uh, like the mobile platform came with a lot of opportunities, but it also came with a host of limitations you know the first mobile phones had really small screens like computing power was low um uh the controls were kind of the the keyboard that was on the phone uh and then it provided this set of limitations to say right what, what's a gate what's a really compelling kind of gameplay experience that can exist within this format um do you see a similar host of like opportunities and then limitations with uh kind of the Juno network and then what as yeah. what game developers can do 100 percent. i mean and I'll, i won't use a sort of a theoretical example I, I'll, I'll use what we talked about before uh so you asked sort of whether we, this was running on l2 right uh on our trusted execution environment so if this was running on a trusted execution environment we would have sort of a seamless um 
transition from minting to forging, I can guarantee you the experience of this game would be horrible. It would be too fast, right? It would be uh, after uh, maybe, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes, just chaotic. Um, and it wouldn't serve the game. Part that makes this game, this game charming, and that goes to what I would say Cedric said before, that since November that we were playtesting this game, and we were playtesting it, playtesting it even live at, at, at Sub-Zero with sort of people there, uh, is trying to find that balance of, as again, not the technology being a bottleneck, but rather using it in a way that it creates an opportunity. So maybe those 10 seconds create that dramatic tension that I need to see whether my forge is going to work, right? Uh, or it needs sort of enough of the time so I can look at the clock, look at my things and sort of make it work. Um, so yeah, it's the same opportunities here. The developers that I will not see the technology as a limitation, but as an opportunity, um, I think are going to have a great experience working with us because I think that's the mindset that we have. I think overall, I mean, if we look a little bit at the, the past, I think limitation make really great creativity. I mean, you can look at the first games where they had like only a small amount of memory or a small amount of hard disk space. So people were like very creative. And uh, like the one screeners that we have seen in the early days of gaming and so on. I mean, there were super creative games there. So I think like it's the same chance again, like with mobile devices and now with the blockchain, it's just like how we use what we have to, ma to make a, a really great user experience. And it doesn't have to be like something, a triple A game, right? Because I mean, even on the mobile devices, you have like those games which are super addictive, but they are not like super special. It's just like finding the right use of what you what you have, right? And I think that's exactly what we are trying to do with, with small things at the moment. And Polkadot serves super for, for this thing. I mean, even those 12 seconds will go into six seconds, which is probably even a little bit more seamless experience for the next seasons, probably. Uh, and uh, yeah. So I think it's more on using what you have uh, to create the best thing that you, or to create, to drive your creativity around it. Maybe where, if just sort of a, a last thought on it, where technology can be considered uh, a limitation, at least here in this case, uh, has to do more with access to the technology. So again, sort of I'll go to the mobile phone. It seems that, um, even if you get sort of all of your eggs lined up and create this perfect little Web3 sort of experience that you want to, uh, that you can onboard users, it still feels like we are developers right now and we have iOS and Android and we're building for Windows Phone, right? So that's another problem. Accessibility to the technology right now is quite sort of limited. And I think that that's where, whether that's called projects like uh, uh, Talisman or more even on an ecosystem level, the faster that we get to ways to sort of seamlessly start onboarding people, then we do create the necessary sort of platform effect or network effect where uh, there's a, there is an opportunity to launch um, products like Awesome Mike Avatars and be able to find a significant audience. Yeah, you raise a really good point about onboarding. Uh, unborn, uh, can't speak, onboarding. Um, because often there's this kind of tug of war between um, the fact that a Web3 project is a Web3 project and users have total ownership of their assets. So you want them to onboard fully and correctly so that they can do a really good job of, you know, custodying those assets so that they don't lose them down the line and have a really poor experience. But on the other side of the tug of war is the... Um, the desire for the onboarding experience to be as smooth as possible. And of course, if you're kind of shooting for like a, a very robust self-custody experience, it's not going to be super smooth because you need to back up your seed phrase and understand what your private key is and then kind of be aware of every transaction that you're approving. Um, so these, these things don't, at least currently don't exist well together. Uh, but I think there's a lot of room for wallets and games or dApps generally to provide 
um, almost like a happy medium between those two points where you might be able to onboard into a game in a really seamless way. It's something that uh, an average internet user would be able to kind of use natively and they don't need to learn about different ways of custodying their assets. Um, oh, and that's fine for the and that's yeah. fine for the short term. But as you start to accumulate assets or influence or some kind of a um, invested cost in the game, then you can take custodying those assets more seriously and uh, kind of upgrade the way you you manage your account in the future. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a very good point. We have, um, I think, especially around technology, we have, uh, we've started to have very short memory, right? Um, you don't need to go web to the way that it looks today, sort of uh, instant access, one click everything is maybe around five, six, seven years, not more. Right, it's it's the first time when we had sort of pre. I'll take another sort of simple example, pre Spotify. You know, where we were like, "Hey, shit, I can download MP3s from LimeWire and this and this and that." If you would take, you know, the 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 standard question that we all like to ask, if you would explain this to your mom, the conversation went pretty much like this: "Hey, you have you heard that you can listen to digital to music sort of online? It's super simple. All you have to do." is go to this website, download this software, make sure they need to download an, an anti um, um, sort of virus software, go create, you know, this plugin so it can recognize the codec. And by the time that I've told you the process about six different installations that you need to do to download one single MP3. And we did it, right? Because it was something unique and, and different. And yeah, we are the early adopters that sort of did these things. And eventually the rest of the market catches up as the experience smoothens out. I think it's pretty much the same thing. Yes, it is a bit of an overhead of open a wallet, but for the people who are interested in this technology, they'll go through it. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, but you know, we have to recognize that there is work to do to smooth out the experience so that your grandma can open Spotify and, and select the Beatles. Or Metallica, depends. I think we have very different grandmas. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, we're reaching kind of uh, the end of our hour, so I wanted to um, ask, what's a call to action that you might have for the community? I mean, you've just spent kind of the last couple of weeks launching awesome Ajuna avatars. We didn't really get time to touch on battle mogs too much. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of thoughts that you would like to leave the community with, but if there is kind of one call to action that you want to uh, leave in people's minds, what would it be? Um, so I think, I mean, the first thing I would like to say is sort of a thank you for for the community showing up and, and supporting the launch of the um, awesome Ayuna avatars. Um, the best thing that we can do here as a community is to sort of spread the word. Right. Uh, if there's an experience that you enjoyed, um, the call to action is, you know, get other people to enjoy it, not only for a Yuna network, but we need this for the ecosystem. We need to support uh, builders, not only the ones that are here in the power chains, but encourage builders to come create experiences. Um, because at the end of the day, I think the battle is going to be won on the application layer. And, and Paul Gadot is lucky enough to have all of the technical expertise and resources to go about it but let's push to get people here to experience different um dApps from all of the builders awesome let's mint and, and forge our way to victory but i will leave you maybe with a small sort of uh teaser maybe for the um for season two so maybe here i can show you uh a concept art from uh, Patrick. Uh, Patrick is our lead designer, uh, obviously super talented. Uh, everything that you see from Awesome Unavatas uh, is made for him. Season two is going to focus on pets. One of the interesting challenges that we're going to have, but we're super excited about it, is that uh, these pets are going to have different sizes. So uh, we're quite excited to see how uh, they work and how they interact with uh, each other. We have, as you can see here, I'll zoom in to see the careful instructions. Uh, to it, as he explained to us that this is not a vacuum cleaner, uh, but a weapon. So it's always good that we have solid instructions um, 
for our awesome uh, you know about this season two game is going to be we'll do our best to make sure that it's um familiar but yet feels fresh and new and different for the users but no more sneak peeks well thanks for the sneak peek uh that's a that's a great um i will be make i'll make sure to be forging so that i have a i have a good pet down the line in season two <laughs> please do please do <laughs>